we know, we've been in, we've been in series. Uh, Challenge accepted is the name of the series. We've been discussing and trying to preach and teach from the idea that we want to embrace the challenges that God allows us to experience in this life. Uh, and even the challenge of making sure that we step up in the midst of life to give God our very best efforts as a church, as individuals, as a church uh, family. We talked about in, in past Sundays the challenge of expectation and excuses and, uh, and other things. And today we want to look at the challenge of experience. Because in life, you're going to experience things you cannot control. And the question isn't what happens, but how you respond. And so today, let's read Acts 7, beginning in verse 54. It reads this way in the New International Version of God's Word, but following whatever version you have. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open, and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And this they covered, at this they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats, at the feet of a young man mm. named Saul. Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. And Saul approved of their killing him. And on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. That was verse 1 of chapter 8. Verse 2 says, Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. And finally, verse 4 says, Those who had been scattered yeah. preached the word yes. wherever they went. Amen. You may be seated in God's presence. After all that they witnessed and began to experience through persecution, verse 4 of chapter 8 in the book of Acts says to us that after all of that, nevertheless, those who had been scattered preached the word and they did it wherever they went there was suffering there was pain there was trauma and tragedy and yet they were scattered and they still preached the word wherever they went and on today sisters and brothers Young people, those who have been seasoned with time, I want to preach from the subject, growing through it. Growing through it. Don't. Notice, I didn't say going through it. Wish you'd help me today. I feel that God has something for us unique today. If you pray with me, God can move. Growing through it. I read an anonymous quote. Coach Dorsey, and uh, I love to give credit, but I couldn't find who I could give credit to. So, Elijah, I'm just going to. Give the quote, and if I come back and find it, I can bring that back. I don't like to be guilty of plagiarism, but the quote, Brother Walker said, it was a question, actually, and it raised the question, are you going through it or growing through it? Good. Good attention. Sisters and brothers, the challenge of life is found not merely in what happens, but how we respond. 
It's why James, in the letter that was penned, the inscription of his name said, Consider it pure joy, brothers and sisters. Whenever, not if, but when you face trials of various kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith is going to produce perseverance. And then you have to let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Anything, yeah. It's why Paul himself, the apostle, said we glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and then perseverance gets working and it produces character and before long character keeps working and within it there comes hope because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given unto us. And then when I move from looking at individual affirmations of faith and I look at how God had to affirm collectively the power of faith and hope and the power of embracing and growing rather than going through what you are going through. I look back at the book of Exodus and the Bible says that in the chapter, the very first chapter of Exodus, this story of emancipation and deliverance where God was delivering the slaves out of Egypt, the Bible says that there were slave masters that were put over the Israelites to oppress them with forced labor and they built uh, cities for Pharaoh, but then it says the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied. The more they suffered, the more they were beat down, the more they were pressed down, the more they were enslaved and, and stretched and endured pain and oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. <clears throat> And so it is that likewise, when we look at our own history, we find out, if we're honest, that it was through hardship that we found a sense of hope. That our ancestors learned through difficulty what it meant to be determined. That we have a rich history that's sprinkled and is highlighted with all sorts of pain and yet out of that great pain we've experienced great progress now we we've, we've still got a long way to go but we ought to be able to celebrate in this month of February and we ought not limit it and confine it to February but we ought to remember at least in February that we were slaves not immigrants. Wow. We were slaves. We didn't enter through Ellis Island. We were slaves. Brought here home. Not the Carnival Cruise Line. Yes, sir. No, no, we didn't arrive on Norwegian, we didn't arrive on Royal Caribbean, we arrived at the bottom of the ship. Have mercy. With feces and yeah. urine. That's graphic, but it's necessary. Because if we forget <coughs> We're subject to be enslaved. Not with steel shackles, but with the shackles of our mind. With the shackles that, that enclose and handicap our spirit and our perspective and warp our outlook and our mindset. Those shackles, we were slaves. We provided labor without compensation. 
we contributed to generational wealth that we could not accumulate ourselves. But in the midst of slavery, we had a song. Who are those children all dressed in red? God's going to trouble the water. Must be the ones that Moses led. God's going to trouble the water. Children, wait in the water. Why? Because God is going to show water. My Lord calls me. He calls me by the thunder. The trumpet sounded in my soul. I ain't got long to stay here. Still away. Jesus steal away on home so I ain't got long to stay here steal away we were slaves but we had a song some of us haven't had to be slaves and don't have a song Because they understood they weren't merely going through it, they had to grow through it. Set it up. Sound good. We were share problems. I've got to hurry. We were share problems. Young people, that means we were underpaid, swindled, manipulated, cut out of what was our rightfully earned and deserved payment for the labor of the land. We we created and cultivated entire industries of agriculture. And yet, despite being taken advantage of, we were resolute and determined in those difficult times. We were three-fifths of a person. Three-fifths. If you're doing fractions at school, young people, that means you were 60% of a person. Not in the mouths of people. Not merely in the minds of the oppressor. But that was written and inscribed in the documents that represented the United States of America. Wow. Three fifths of a person. Yet, despite the fact that we were only three fifths, we listened to black preachers. Some of us, and I'm going to go ahead and say it, got to the point where we can't listen to a black preacher anymore. Say I quiet some of us out there. None of y'all, but some of your friends and other family that <laughs> we all preach the gospel. So it doesn't matter if you're white, red, with polka dots, black, blue, or purple. That's not the issue. The issue is if you stop listening to black preachers. But the black preacher was the one that sometimes had an education. Sometimes he didn't. But they knew how to tell us sometimes with broken English and with an impeccable memory for those that couldn't read but had to memorize what they heard somebody read too. They could come in on a Sunday morning or come in whenever they had church if it was once a month or once every other week and they could tell you and they could quote what the Bible says which was what the psalmist says that you created us in our inmost being and you knit us together in our mother's womb and we praise you. Why? Because we're fearfully and wonderfully made. Even though 
we're three fifths of a person. Yeah. We were hidden figures. Yeah. I wish you'd help me and you'd help me move right along. We were hidden figures forced to sew into the fabric of this American society behind the scenes. Deprived of deserving appreciation, yet we pursued excellence with persistence. And we became mathematicians and scientists, doctors and lawyers, educators and entrepreneurs, athletes and artists, creators and innovators, scholars and teachers, electricians and inventors. Because our ancestors, and you don't have to go way back to slavery, you can go back to your grandparents. Somebody ought to be able to remember what you heard your big mama say. You ought to be able to remember what you heard your uncle or your papa or your mother and your father or your cousin. Somebody in your family grew up quoting stuff like, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will. Because God is with us. Yeah. His rod and his staff, they comfort us. And God even goes as far as preparing a table for us in the presence of our enemies. Some of you heard somebody say, he who began a good work in you shall complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Well, some of us need to be able to personalize this, so I'm going to stop telling you what we heard other folks say, and I'm going to start telling you what I've learned how to say myself. I've learned how to say, I can do all things through the Him, the one that gives me strength. If God is for me, then who can be against me? No weapon that is formed against me shall prosper. of the servants of the Lord. See, you got to be able, and I'm trying to hurry, you got to be able to say some things for yourself. So I wonder if I have anybody who's learned how to thank God for yourself. You've learned how to tell God thank you for my blessings. And not only did you bless my mama, but you blessed me. Not only did you bless my papa, but you blessed me. You've given me shelter. You've given me clothes in my closet. You've given me a good job. And me a good man. Me a good woman. Me and the family, you given me a car, you kept gas in my car, you kept my airplane in the sky, you woke me up this morning, you started me on my way, you laid me to rest last night, watched over my house and watched over my children and kept me in my right mind. It's gotta be personal. And so, we've learned this. And here's the message in the sentence. You and I have to understand that God uses the struggle of adversity to strengthen our faith. That's it. I hope you call it. That's all I got. God uses the struggle of adversity to strengthen your faith. He takes what's dark, dismal, disappointing, disheartening, discouraging, distressing, depressing, devastating, difficult, and uses that to deposit within you power, beautiful and strength, and maturity so that, watch this, you don't have to look like what you've been through. See how clear that is? Right here in this text because Deacon Stephen. Yes, sir. 
stands in the midst of self-righteous Sanhedrin council members. And he declares how ungrateful, fraudulent, and rebellious they have been toward God. Despite, catch this, how remarkable God has been toward them. And he said, and, and in the text, he's met with anger, and he's met with vitriol and animosity, and they're gnashing of teeth as they make up in their minds that Stephen would pay the price of exposing their religious masquerade with his life. In other words, did Stephen call them out? Told them, you are phony, fake, and fraudulent. You wear robes every day, but there's no God. Right. Yeah. Right. We gotta be careful. Right. Again, we don't forget it's not merely what we wear. Right. Yeah. Right. See, I can wear white, black, whatever other color we decide we're gonna wear. But if my heart's filthy, if my mind is cluttered, if if my attitude is bad, if I'm mean spirited and I'm condescending and I don't welcome folk in and I don't invite folk in and I'm not hospitable and I'm not loving and not caring, then what good is my garment if my soul and my spirit is all jacked up? <laughs> wow. Wow. I don't want a clean robe and a corroded heart. Woo! You can tweet that later on this afternoon. Don't have a clean start shirt, but mildew in your spirit. There's some stuff in your heart, in your mind, in, in my heart, in my mind, my spirit that that lime and 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 Clorox and bleach can't get off. And God has to get in. So that's what Stephen was doing. He was exposing the religious masquerade. He was basically saying, you brothers in the Sanhedrin Council, you walk around like you're better than everybody. You, 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 you hinder and handicap people with your religious regulations, but there's no love, grace, or mercy inside of your hearts. You're religious, but you have no relationship with God. Right. Right. That you can literally come to church and not know God. You can wear a robe and not know it. And so Stephen is said to be executed by the process of being stoned. And this occasion is marked both by his death and the aftermath of persecution that began toward everyone else who dared to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And therefore, Scripture says, Saul approved of their killing him. And on that day, great persecution broke out against the church. And everybody except the apostles fled, scattered throughout all of Judea and Samaria. And some godly men came and buried Stephen. They mourned for him. Uh, and then Saul went around, ravaging the church, destroying and dragging men and women into prison just because of their faith. And those who were scattered, though, the Bible says that nevertheless, they kept preaching yeah. the word. Everywhere. They were scattered. They saw suffering. Some of them were scared, but they kept spreading the good news. Anybody can spread the good news when you're comfortable, when you're sitting in a nice pew with cushion. But can you spread the message when folk don't want to hear it? When it's a risk to your well-being, a risk to your reputation, a risk to your future, your very existence. The Bible says they kept spreading, which is confirmation of a promise. That's the evidence of spiritual growth in the lives of these ancient Christians and it applies to us when we understand that their willingness to spread that message in the midst of being scattered by persecution was confirmation of a promise. How do we know that? 
Because if you go back and you look at chapter 1 of Acts, you find out that there's a post-resurrection assurance given by Jesus himself. Jesus is resurrected. He, he arrives. He shows up. Uh, people are gathered and they're, they're praying. And, and Jesus arrives. And in Acts 1, Luke writes that Jesus tells the believers, you will receive power. Yes, sir. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses, catch that, in Jerusalem, in all of Judea, yes. and Samaria, and to the uttermost yeah. parts of the earth. That's the promise, yep. That was Acts 1-8. Come back to Acts 8-1. Acts 8-1 says, saw the fruit of their killing. On that day, great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem and all the all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Yeah. Acts 1 8 you will receive power and you will be my witnesses in all of Judea and Samaria. Yeah. Acts 8 1 all except the apostles were scattered and spreading the good news in Judea and Samaria. One more time, because three is usually a charm. Acts 1 8 says, You will receive power, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria. Acts 8 1 says, And they were scattered, and throughout Judea and Samaria, they spread the good news. There was purpose attached to their adversity. Persecution created the platform for ministry. The persecution created the additional platforms of missionary service and ministry. They couldn't spread the message to other parts of the world until persecution happened. Opposition created opportunity for the expansion of the church's witness in the world. Here's the question. What adversity is God using to affirm his presence and power in your life? What struggle is God allowing that he might strengthen you for something even greater? Wow. What hardship or heartbreak has God permitted to occur in your life that he is in the process of using to propel you forward into new spaces and territories and give you new opportunities that you would not otherwise have. You have to learn to see adversity and to see opposition spiritually. Because if I look at it spiritually, I'm going to see the opportunity in the opposition. I'm going to see the potential in the persecution and in the pain. I'm going to see God's purpose in my problems. That I'm going through it, but I'm growing through it because God already promised he would work through me. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. For the good of those who love him yes, and who have been called according to his purpose. Not yours, not mine. Yes. Yes, sir. All things may not be working together for you yet. If you don't embrace loving God and submitting yourself to his purpose. So they had confirmation of a promise. But
Yeah. So another man could usher in advancement for the church. One man lived with faith and died. So that another man headed for self-destruction could live. Stephen lived with faith and died. So that Saul, who was headed for self-destruction, could be transformed and live. And live. Yeah. One man headed to heaven. I see where you're going. But another man headed to hell was able to live. I see where you're going. Yeah, I see. Because Stephen was providentially placed in front of Saul. Right. Because God wanted to show Saul what faith looked like. What suffering looked like. Because God was going to take that young man named Saul and turn him into the apostle named Paul. And Paul could not be Paul until Saul looked at what was wrong with Saul. And Saul couldn't understand what was wrong with Saul until he looked at Stephen. So God put Stephen in front of Saul so that Saul could become Paul. Tweet that later. God put Stephen in front of Saul so that Saul could later on become Paul. That's providence. But you know what I had to also think about? Stephen as valiant and faithful as he was, he was a martyr. Yes. Which meant his death can be remembered, yes. but it wasn't redemptive. Yes. Somebody knows where I'm going when I'm done. Yeah. His death can be celebrated, yes, but it doesn't have the capability yes, of restraining and redirecting the wrath of God away from everybody else. Yes, Stephen's death was agonizing, but it had no atoning power for the sins of the rest of us. So Stephen was a martyr, but Jesus is the Messiah. Stephen was the martyr, but Jesus had to be the Savior. So that's why it was not Stephen's death that saved us. It was Jesus' death. And that's why scripture says, son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered. And once he was made perfect, then he became the source of our eternal salvation for all who obey him. In other words, even the Savior had to grow through it. The Bible says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds and by his bruises and by his stripes, we are healed. Because it was a death, not of Stephen, but of Jesus, who had to also learn how to grow through it. That saved us. And that's why I like the song that Rick Dillard sang when he said, We stand in awe of you, amazed at the things you do. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain for me. No one compares to you. No one compares to you. No one compares to you because you're amazing. You're amazing. And for the rest of the song, all he said was, you're amazing. For the rest of the chorus, all they kept saying, and I broke down and cried this morning when I heard that song playing in my house. Because I had to stop and think about all I've had to go through. And then I had to stop and think about all that I've had to grow through. Yeah.